The giant sucking sound was the United States presidential candidate Ross Perot's colorful phrase for what he believed would be the negative effects of the North American Free Trade Agreement, or NAFTA, which he opposed. The phrase, coined during the 1992 U.S. presidential campaign, referred to the sound of U.S. jobs heading south for Mexico should the proposed free trade agreement go into effect. Perot ultimately lost the election, and the winner, Bill Clinton, supported NAFTA, which went into effect on January 1, 1994. The phrase has since come into general use to describe any situation involving loss of jobs or fear of a loss of jobs, particularly by one nation to a rival. Okay, we're going to play an activity today a simulation where you're going to be employers and employees. In this simulation, students role play employers and workers in the t-shirt industry to demonstrate the impact of changes in worker productivity on labor markets. Then, using what they discover in the simulation, student teams consider whether expanding into international labor markets can increase profits for a fictional employer, income for workers, and wealth for the society as a whole. So the purpose of this activity is twofold. To allow students to experience how the productivity of workers determines the wage rates they can command in labor markets, and to help students understand why, in open markets, jobs move to where the level of labor productivity is consistent with the characteristics of the job. Students participate in a simulated labor market in the t-shirt industry, acting as either employers or prospective workers. The t-shirt industry was chosen because it involves high-skilled jobs like design, marketing, and accounting, and even low-skilled jobs like cutting, sewing, and printing. Additionally, the real-world credentials of the example are impeccable. Included in the activity is an internet advertisement for workers to cut and sew t-shirts in a Mexican factory that wholesales to American t-shirt retailers. The ad for the fictitious factory is a compilation of actual website advertisements posted in the 1990s by companies located in northern Mexico. Setup for this activity is fairly simple. You'll need two different colors of index cards. In this simulation, we use yellow and pink. Four to six copies of the employer record, and one copy of the output and marginal product schedule for each student in the class. Additionally, you'll want to prepare PowerPoint slides or overhead transparencies of visuals 1 through 10 to aid in the flow of the activity and the discussion that will follow. This activity fits well in the study of global economics or international trade. If you have not yet talked about how wages are determined, you may need to do a little pre-teaching. And even if you have, it wouldn't hurt to remind students that wages are determined by the supply of labor and the demand for labor. In this activity, most of the students are suppliers of labor, and a few of the students, the employers, demand labor. Work through the Output and Marginal Product Schedule worksheet together, so students realize that employees are valuable to employers because they produce. And their value to the employer depends on two things. One, how much they add to the production process, and two, how much that product sells for in the marketplace. A profit-maximizing employer would not be willing to offer a wage that is more than the value of the marginal product of that worker. Point out that skilled workers add more to the production process than unskilled workers, so this explains why employers might be willing to pay them more. This worksheet provides useful information for both employees and employers in the simulation, but employers will refer to the sheet regularly to determine the profitability of their hiring decisions. Choose employers and assign the rest of the students to be employees. If your class is large enough, it is often a good idea to choose a pair of students to play each employer role so that they can help each other out with the math. If the class is small, you will have fewer employers and can probably help them yourself. You'll need to adjust the number of employers to the size of your class. 
A good rule of thumb is to have one employer for every five or six employees. Give each employer an employer profit worksheet. Give them some time to work through it and answer any questions that they might have. In the meantime, give each employee a yellow card. The yellow cards signify that they are unskilled workers. Prepare the yellow index cards ahead of time by randomly writing four, five, or six dollars on each one. This represents the money each unskilled worker starts with. Explain that later in the game, they will have the opportunity to go to school and become skilled pink card workers. The university will be open in between rounds and they can purchase an education for $25. For smaller classes, you can play the role of the educator but for larger classes, you may want to assign a student to this role. Simply take their yellow card, subtract $25, and write the remaining balance on the top of their new pink card. Only pink card workers may take skilled pink card jobs. Explain to the employers that their goal is to make a profit. Profits are equal to the difference between revenues and the cost of production. To keep things simple, there's only one cost of production in this activity, and that's labor. And their revenue comes from selling the t-shirts produced. The number of t-shirts they can produce is determined by how many employees they hire. And to keep things simple, we'll assume that they can sell all the t-shirts they produce. The goal of each employee, of course, is to make as much income as possible. So while employers will try to negotiate relatively low wages to maximize their profits, employees will try to negotiate relatively high wages to maximize their income. Both employers and employees can use their profits and income at the end of the game to purchase candy from the classroom store. Before beginning round one, explain to the employers that they may hire as many workers as is profitable for them. Also explain that employees can search for a job from any employer, but they may only get one job per round. Once they have a job, the employer will write the agreed upon wage on their card, initial it, and then they should return to their seat until the round is over. Answer any questions the students might have, but also assure them that this is a jump in and figure it out activity. They'll learn as they go. Okay, the market's open, get a job. Round one is almost over. Allow enough time in round one for most students to get a job and then call time. Okay, we'll call this the end of round one. The university is open. Form a line over here, bring your cards. You have As the employers are calculating their profits, Open the university for any students that have at least $25 on their blue cards. Then conduct rounds two and three the same way. Now you can go get a job. Hey, the round is over. Round is over. Have a seat. Okay, the university once again is open. If you need an education, come up, line up here at the university. Anybody going to school? $25, great bargain for a diploma. Prestigious university. Very prestigious. Okay, we are going to run one more round, okay? We're gonna run one more round, and so the market is open. You know my price? Hey, 15 seconds. Usually by round three, most workers have purchased an education to upgrade their skill level, resulting in an oversupply of pink card workers and a shortage of yellow card workers. When this happens, stop the game and conduct a simple debrief to find out who the most profitable employees were and who the most profitable employers were. Ask them about their strategies, use the other debriefing questions outlined in the teacher's guide to this lesson to get to the bottom of what was behind employers' decisions to hire and employees' decisions to take a job and get an education. Eric, you're pointing out a problem that there seems to be not very many unskilled workers anymore. And so for you, you're saying maybe it's in my best interest to, to remain an unskilled worker because there are so few of you, right? 
At this point, you're ready to move on to part two of the activity. So ask the employers if they were to play another round of the game, would there be enough yellow card workers? Probably not. The answer right? is no. So, then ask them why they would like to have more yellow card workers. They should realize that this would allow them to make more profit. For example, it doesn't do any good to hire another t-shirt designer or marketer if they can't hire people to cut and sew the shirts. Have students return to the employers who hired them last and explain that you have a problem you want them to discuss and solve as a team. Here's the problem. You are a member of your company's Make It Work Circle and your firm has adopted a profit sharing scheme. So the more profitable your firm is... Provide each team work. with a copy of the problem handout and display it while you read through the problem with the class. Give the team some time to discuss possible solutions and then chart their ideas on the board. Not all of their ideas will be practical, so be prepared to give them some ideas that they may overlook, like using more machinery to replace low-skilled workers. At this point, introduce the Pinyasa Internet Advertisement and the discussion questions that go with it. Have each student answer the questions from the perspective of the role they are playing in the activity. So, how would an unskilled worker feel about this solution? How would a skilled worker feel? What about the employer? As a large group, use the visual to discuss who is hurt and who is helped when unskilled jobs are exported to Mexico. As you wrap up this activity, focus on these big ideas. First, markets move resources to where they are valued most. And in this case, the jobs are moving to the resources. In other words, jobs seek out locations with the appropriate resources to produce at least cost. The Mexican labor force is, in general, less skilled than the U.S. labor force, and that's attractive to employers with jobs requiring low skills. Second, while some jobs have disappeared from the U.S. as companies move or subcontract abroad, the total number of jobs has increased partly as a result of the efficiencies and the wealth created by producing with the lowest cost resources. In our scenario, the total number of jobs would increase as the company expanded. The distribution of jobs between the U.S. and Mexico would change, with the U.S. office of the t-shirt company doing the high-skilled jobs and the Mexican factory would do the low-skilled jobs. The trade cost jobs argument seems to have intuitive appeal and persists in the thinking of many. So the challenge for teachers in this activity is to move students past the mental roadblock that prevents them from recognizing the huge benefits of international trade to Americans and to our trading partners.